Welcome to Canada's podcast. So, Mark, Matt, welcome to Canada's podcast. Uh, Great to meet you. Uh, We were earlier discussing how we were maybe once neighbours about 20 years ago when you were starting out in Liberty area and I was moving out of the Liberty area. But, you know, why don't you guys, you know, just sort of one after the other, give us a little bit of insights on your entrepreneurial journey, how you stumbled into entrepreneurship and and where it's taken you, if you like. Great. Thanks, Philip. Uh, Maybe I'll I'll jump in uh, first. and, And thanks again for having us on today. It's great to connect with you. Um, you know, I think what, what's really exciting for Matt and I, as we look back at the journey of Marble Media, which started now 20 years ago, uh, mm-hmm. is that it, it, it's rooted in, in a solid friendship, right, that, that Tim and I found when we actually went to Ryerson University uh, and studied in the radio and television arts program. And I'll just say what was interesting about kind of coming together those you know, 20 years, well, <laughs> a little bit earlier than that, about you know, 25, <laughs> almost 30 years ago now. Uh, but who's counting? Who's counting the gray hairs? Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of coming together and kind of finding that shared passion from day one, you know, of a friendship and a passion for the media business uh, and, and through that program. And what was interesting, we both came from very different places and moved to Toronto uh, for the first time to for university. My background, I grew up in just outside of St. John, New Brunswick. Um, you know, and I think Matt and I both share clearly an entrepreneurial bug. My entrepreneurial bug started really young, I know, in terms of, you know, painting houses and working in, in, in my neighborhood to, you know, mm-hmm. run a small mm-hmm. business to do that, to then launching a DJ company um, called Shakedown Sounds, which we expanded to Shakedown Sounds and Lights when we <laughs> raised a bit more uh, profile in the industry in, in New Brunswick, uh, you know, to in everything from school radio station, newspaper, uh, summer camp, all of those type of things, just kind of seeing an opportunity, right? And looking at at the slate and looking what was out there and saying, you know, what's missing, you know, and how could I bring uh, a skill, a passion to kind of, uh, you know, both identify an opportunity and really launch something, right? And take a risk, right? And I think that, um, I think for both of us that came at a really young age, and I'm, I'm thankful for that because that was, again, part of my entrepreneurial journey that started really early that carried with me. So that, you know, again, it's, you know, but have, having that drive and then having that passion, uh, which then happened again when, like I said, when flash forward, moving to Toronto um, and, you know, meeting Matt while we were in university, working on projects, finding that, that you know, shared passion and shared vision uh, to think big, to think, you know, yes, this, this is the box, but how do you go and do that? We did a massive project in our final year, a big group project that uh, we were both on the leadership team for. Uh, where we did a big live event, we were broadcast on two networks, we raised a whole bunch of money. Uh, and you really just saw the potential uh, that that experience had to kind of open the door that this could really be, uh, you know, a, a dynamic powerhouse of being able to work together. Uh, and of course, we both went off and worked for other companies for a few years after university. Uh, we kept doing side projects and talking about what it could be. And eventually, and it was, you know, again, the end of 2000, beginning of 2001, where we both quit our day jobs took that leap, you know, and started on, on that, that journey of our own uh, to, build, to build Marble Media. And so I think, again, I would say it's a, it's a, deep, a deep passion uh, for the industry. It's a friendship. Uh, and, and it's that, that entrepreneurial curse of seeing an opportunity. And when we started Marble, it was really about, you know, how can we look at, again, this is 2001. So how do we look at the new way of, of telling stories? That yes, it would be linear content and it would be television. That's still an important driver and not going away. But how could we leverage uh, interactive technologies? How could we start to build games and apps? How could we stream content uh, on a mobile device, which you know was unheard of back then? But we did a prototype uh, back in 2003 showing what that would look like. And so the, those things were the foundations of our company of just kind of showing uh, to the industry that we thought differently and that we could think differently and, and imagine, you know, what the future of entertainment experiences could be and prove to him and I that we could start to build something that was going to be really unique uh, and ultimately have fun uh, creating and building a company together. So Matt, what about your story? How did, you know, some of it's parallel, I'm sure, but uh, you come from different areas, different backgrounds. So I'm interested to know yours. Yeah, there's certainly certainly a lot of parallels, as Mark was describing. Uh, I'm an only child. I came from a very small town. I grew up in the, in, a, in a wooded uh, acreage out in the country. 
Um, so quite isolated in many ways. Uh, and I found a lot of uh, very close with my parents as an only child, uh, but found a lot of creativity through play um, and had sort of a, a fake radio station that I would do with friends whenever they would come over. Um, and uh, at an early age, like Mark, had that entrepreneurial spirit uh, all through high school. Um, only at one time did I work for another company and got fired after a few weeks because I wasn't doing the paperwork properly. It was hev heavily administrative, and that wasn't something at the time that I was good at. Um, <laughs> and I just tapped into things that I really felt like I was great at. So ran a drama camp on my own. I uh, made a ton of money the following summer doing that. I ended up doing video production for the local lawyers, um, had an edit suite and, and, you know, set up in my bedroom. So uh, just, you know, at a very early age, like Mark, just knew that I wanted to be uh, control my own destiny um, through through storytelling. So since grade 10, I knew I wanted to make television shows, did a lot of research um, like Mark, then, you know, decided I wanted to go to uh, School of Radio and Television Arts at Ryerson. And, and I agree with Mark. It's really that friendship. You know, and that's something that both he and I could have never really imagined, and that is being two very strong-willed, creative individuals coming from sort of similar backgrounds, small towns, uh, coming to the big city, looking for promise and excitement of the next chapter in our lives, but then finding a way where one and one uh, actually made three or four, and we were so much stronger uh, as a team because of it, and we continue to be that way today, 20 years later. It's had its ups and downs like any relationship. I mean, we've been together now longer than a lot of marriages last. Uh, and with that, that and, and with in a lot more complex situations, a lot, you know, when you're dealing with money, a lot of money, um, you know, sometimes a lot of money going in the wrong direction. Um, and so I think through that, though, we've really used the fundamentals of this relationship, trust, respect, communication. And that's where the strength goes. It's what you need in any healthy relationship and one that you really need in a partnership, one that's 50-50, mm -hmm. um, because there's no mediator in all of this. It's only he and I that have to work through any problems we may have together. And uh, I think uh, we've always been able to find common ground. Uh, eerie, actually, sometimes how, <laughs> how often we see, see eye to eye on things. And when we don't, we find ways to work it out. And we're smarter and stronger as a company because we've brought those different perspectives and we've found ways to find a shared vision for that as Mark described. So you, you, you mentioned the money side of it. And, and I mean, you know, media is a big uh, sector in, in certainly in, 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 in the GT, GTHA and, uh, and, you know, pretty big across, across Canada as well. You know, on, on the money front, you know, just for other people that maybe just starting, you know, twenty. You imagine twenty years, you guys, twenty years ago. How, how does it? How does it kind of? What kind of advice can you offer in terms of, you know, being able to execute those what I term BFIs, which you know, the big fucking ideas. Um, um, the 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 you know that the you you guys have done ba basically so uh, maybe you can kind of give some give some insights on on how you get to play the game basically on um, in the media side of it yeah well i think absolutely i think the thing that we learned really early on um and it's a simple business practice but is really to surround ourselves with people that are smarter than us in certain areas and I would say, I mean, the great thing about the media industry in Canada is that there are a lot of people who have gone down this road before. There's a lot who have experience. Um, you know, there's both a, you know, a freelance pool of people that's incredibly strong in this industry because it's such a freelance based business, as well as those who have gone on to start their own company and, um, you know, and, and then are, are available for consultation and, and so on. And I think that that's the thing that we learned early on that in terms of as we were thinking about you know, budgeting, you know, for a big project. Well, you know, really going out there and finding people who had done it before, uh, because I think you have to be really careful not to sell yourself short uh, in terms of what some of these things are going to take. Uh, because, you know, again, we all have to dream really big. Uh, everybody wants a big idea. Uh, every buyer wants a big idea and more so now than ever. Uh, mm -hmm. But you really need to make sure you don't undersell yourself. So, you know, finding just as an example, you know, great line producers who can do a budget, you know, for what that's going to cost, you yeah. know, consulting with, with them to look at, you know, union and guild arrangements and what, you know, what those are going to be, 
uh, because this industry, um, you know, it keeps the lawyers and the accountants very busy and you need those people uh, on your side really early on and, and solid advisors uh, because, you know, you have to be careful. There's a lot of, uh, of money at stake to Matt's point from before. There's a lot of chances that you could lose your shirt really easily uh, and you have to be careful not to overcommit. Uh, so having those, those, you know, advisors around you, um, you know, kind of allows you to take the big leaps right? and allows you to try and do things uh, again, that, that may be just outside of your grasp. Right. And it, at the same point, I mean, I think also not being afraid to dream big and to have those big ideas. So one of our first projects was actually a website. Uh, so, you know, here we are launching a TV company. Our first project's a website. Uh, and this is back in 2002, right, uh, for deaf children. So it's all in, in American Sign Language, right. which we then spun off into a TV series. So you can imagine going to a broadcaster and pitching that idea. We want to do a, a you know, website and a web. You know, no one's making a web series in 2002. They thought we were crazy. But again, you ha- we had to reach, right? And we said, we're, and we're also going to build a website with these tools that will do X, Y, and Z. And they kind of looked at us like we were speaking a different language. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, we believe we had the conviction that we could do it. You know, we were out there meeting people and finding the networks of people that could help us pull that off. Uh, and it's through partnerships and, you know, get, you know, expanding that, that network. And it's kind of what's required to have the big ideas is that you realize like nobody in the media industry does it on their own. So it really is about surrounding yourself with smart people that can help uh, elevate uh, your idea. And at the same point, also protect you as you start to think about how to put together, you know, budgets, financing, deal structure, and all of that, uh, because it does take um, some understanding of, of, you know, the framework. Yeah. Okay. Matt, just get, let's throw you another question, which is really kind of interesting one. If you could go back in time to when you were beginning, what advice would you give yourself? You know, 20, 20 years, 22 years earlier kind of thing. What advice would you give yourself if, you, if, you, if you'd only known kind of thing? And it's an excellent question to ask one's self. Uh, obviously, so much uh, in life is 2020 hindsight. Um, you know, and that's kind of the beauty of, uh, I guess, of, um, <laughs> I don't know, of, of being naive when you're in your early 20s, you, you don't know what you don't know. And that's probably a good thing, because I think if you knew too much, you'd probably just stop. <laughs> you would just stop right there and go, oh, this, the risk is too great, you know, and that's true for so many entrepreneurs. Like you have to look past the risk. And I, you know, I, I think of a lot of people that Mark and I know professionally in the world who are not entrepreneurs that maybe work on the buyer's side for broadcasters. And we have so much respect. They're so smart. Uh, we think, wow, they're just so much smarter than us. Uh, and then you have a conversation when you realize, oh, there's something different between us and them. And that is that we're willing to take risk and they are not. And they were the first ones to admit that. And, um, you know, like they're, they're spending millions of dollars, hopefully on our shows, but it's not really their money. Um, and every dollar that Mark and I spend on shows, it's our money. <laughs> And so we have to make sure that it's spent in the right way. And if we lose that money, that money's lost. And there's no one else we can go to to solve that problem than, than he and I. So the risk is real. Um, but it's also what drives us. It doesn't scare Mark and I. Um, and my wife, actually, she has an MBA. So classic business person, very, very smart. I've learned so much from her. And you say, about what, what, you know, what have you kind of learned if you could look back? I wish I had taken more business courses probably early on just to have some more foundational thinking about how to structure um, businesses and and surround yourself with people. But it's also a creative business and it's pretty fickle. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we used good intuition when we needed to on the bright partnerships that we needed to. And so I don't, I don't regret a lot of those decisions that we made, but uh Anyway, when I talked to my wife about it, I mean, she's like, I can't believe the amount of risk that you're kind of, you and Mark are willing to take on a day-to-day basis. And I think that is what separates entrepreneurs from a lot of other people. But, you know, how much of that do I wish I had known 20 years from now? I'm just not sure how much of that I would want to know anyway, to be honest. There's probably some foundational things in business that would have been good. There was, I think, Wayne took one business course at, at Ryerson. Um, but uh, so there would have been some other things that would have been it would have been nice to have known back then. But ultimately, I think we trusted our intuition when we needed to. And intuition is also a very important mm-hmm. quality in an entrepreneur. Then you have to listen to that. It's really important. What's the best 
piece of advice. This is one for, for both of you that that, that you've you, that you've received. You know, like that kind of mentorship thing. You, you know, you've obviously bumped into others that have passed on knowledge, with, and it's it's that, that those deep knowledge, the one that you, you know you never forget. It's kind of in the background all the time. I mean, I'd like you both to answer this one because uh, I think it's a, a real important one for people uh, that, that that are kind of starting on the journey kind of thing. I'm curious what, what yours would be, Matt. Mine would be the one that comes to mind right away when you ask that question, Philip. Um, about uh, six or eight years, but eight years, I think, into running the company, uh, we were awarded an award from Ryerson University um, called the Isidore Sharp um, outstanding, uh, graduate, outstanding recent graduate award. Um, and so again, Isidore Sharp, a Ryerson graduate, went on to obviously found the Four Seasons Hotel chain. Uh, so it was a, you know, a huge honor for Matt and I to receive the award. Uh, and uh, part of it, we had a chance to go and spend time with him, uh, which, was, uh, which was amazing, right? To actually go to his office at the Four Seasons and sit down with him and meet some of his team and have a conversation. Uh, and there were a few things, you know, that he said that day that really stuck with me, um, because I think as, you know, he talked about what it was like building Four Seasons, right? And, and uh, which, funny enough, he started just around the corner from Ryerson with his first hotel, um, you know, but he talked a lot about, you know, kind of the dynamics of building a team and sort of who, who is going to be with you uh, mm -hmm. at each different stage of the company. So that was one of the, actually the hardest things for him was that you start the company with sort of one set of people. And as you grow and build, you need to have other people around you. So we talk about other advisors, other specialists in different areas. Uh, and that's difficult because sometimes, you know, you have certain people who are there for part of the journey. When you get to that next phase, like, you know, companies kind of grow in phases. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you get to that next phase, be it, you know, you're expanding in a different way or you need different skill sets. Those people that were on for that part of the journey may not be on for the next part of the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's difficult, right? Because of course, those are people that have helped you get to that level. But as yeah. you said, there are certain people that kind of are there for one phase. And they come on at, and then, you know, they, they exit and, and others come on because they bring a different skill set. Uh, and then tied in with that, he said, you know, with, with that and with all of your decisions as you make moving forward, you know, two things he says, you, you know, in guide, as a guiding principle uh, is to be fair, but firm, right? So fair as, as a good listener and fair, you know, in terms of hearing others' perspectives but to also make decisions, right? And be firm and, and clear in your convictions and, and, and firm in, in your decisions uh, to provide clarity for your team because you can't waffle. You have to be, you know, as leaders of the organization, you have to be clear in the direction. Uh, take as much advice as possible, but make a clear decision and, and move forward. Uh, and to me, those words really stuck with me, um, you know, as we've, we've continued to, to build and grow the company. Matt, you, you would say the same or do you have another... It's, One, yeah, mine's not nearly as interesting, but I, I totally agree with Mark. I mean, it it's such it was such a powerful comment from uh, Isidore Sharp, and um, and so true, so insightful. And he was a great guy. I also did did a, did a session with him, and yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, and so many people since then, like I think of Netflix, they talk about how important it is to think of your company as a team, not as a family. And you think, oh, well, what, what's the difference? And it's like, well, it's actually quite a bit of difference because the family is with you for life um, and the team team isn't. You trade people, you move people. And that's sort of that dynamic that Mark's describing that uh, people that you're with the journey in that first chapter may not be with you for other chapters. And, and it's, a, it's a living, breathing organism. My, my, mine is very simple and that is cash flow. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's so boring. It's so boring, but it's so important. And I guess, you know, we've come to see, hear that from a few CEOs that we really respect in our industry of how you really always got to keep your eye on that cash flow because you can ultimately have really profitable years, but it doesn't matter if you can't pay for everything next week. Right. So, um, you know, you always have to kind of, Keep, and I think that's true for so many industries. And our industry is a complicated one because uh, it's not uh, the cash isn't always there in the till. You're often having to reinvest money into your development slate. Uh, yeah. Also, the timing of projects. We don't do service work. We do a lot of you know uh, shows that require different partners and government financing, which means there's a lot of delay on when the money comes in. So we're spending money, but we're getting that money back two years later. And so. It's, uh, it's very complicated um, uh, from an accounting point of view and from a cash point of view. And we have a really solid relationship with a bank, with HSBC, which has been uh, integral to our success. 
What What are you guys most excited about in in your your sector, business sector at the moment? Well, I think it's an exciting time in the content sector because, again, every week we see a new streaming platform launching, and we and we read the stats about audiences consuming more and more content. I mean. Uh, the pandemic has been a challenge for a lot of people uh, in a lot of industries, for sure. But I think the one thing we can say about the content industry is that audiences during the pandemic have consumed a lot of content and will continue to. V viewing habits have changed. Families have come together to watch content together uh, because we're all at home. <laughs> we're not traveling. We're we're here. And so I think all of those things for our industry are actually very positive because it means there are more opportunities to create and tell stories. Uh, there are more platforms looking to engage in content. Uh, and I think especially in here in Canada, uh, I mean, a pandemic aside, the 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 industry is is really flourishing because again, you look at all of these streaming services who continue to want to invest in Canada. Why? Because we've got great talent. Uh, we've got great ideas. We've got great great producers right across the country that have a ton of chutzpah and a ton of great ideas and are very ingenious of how they do that. We've got a government who supports our industry, um, you know, and sees the value both in domestic production as well as exporting that that content around the world. Uh, you know, and I think there's it, it's definitely shifting and changing uh, in terms of the role of the broadcasters versus the streamers and the system and regulatory and all of that stuff. So with, you know, like anything, it's going through a, a you know massive revolution on the regulatory side and and all of that. But I think if there's disruption uh, and then there's real opportunity uh, again for as Matt pointed out, I mean, we're storytellers. So the idea to have more platforms that we can tell stories and, and share these stories with, I think it's an exciting time. Matt? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Mark. Um, it's, uh, it's very disruptive, um, and, you know, which I think is always a challenge for any industry that's going through uh, a, a digital disruption. But hey, we're, we're not the first to experience that. There's a lot of other industries that had to reinvent themselves. Uh, and our industry is currently doing that. Uh, but with that reinvention, um, we want to make sure we're riding that wave. And we have been with multiple Netflix shows, a lot of American shows that we're doing with our Canadian partners. So we're finding those opportunities on how to think of content differently and how to put the business model of it uh, together um, as well. So, yeah, I think we find it to be in a very exciting time. I think the, the big thing, what we've come to realize after now doing this for 20 years there's always something. There's always something in the industry to be worried about. Um, you know, they think of the Canadian media industry. It's evolved a lot in 20 years. And it had its heyday, and then it didn't, and then it did again, and then it didn't. And now it's sort of on a downward cycle a little bit again. But it'll, it'll resurge and resurface, and it'll, it'll be something new and different. Stories, I mean, it's at the DNA of who we are as human beings. Uh, we've been telling stories for hundreds of thousands of as long as we've been around as homo sapiens sapiens so uh you know i think uh you know we should we should just be confident that tv and storytelling will always be there in some form there'll be an opportunity as a storyteller uh to create something for audiences so just just a just a couple of fun things and we'll have to kind of call it call it quits um each of you if you had to pick one word to describe yourself what would it be and why <laughs> oh, I've never been asked that question. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> wow. Matt, you got anything in, my, in, in your brain there? Uh, yeah, maybe Mark and I should be doing them for each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I... <laughs> It's, it's a really tough question. It's a very good question to ask. Uh, I think there, I, I've been told and I can relate to being pensive. Um, and I see it in one of my two sons. Uh, and I think he gets that quality from me. And part of it is being kind of lost in my own thoughts, in my own head. Part of it is uh, an extension of being an introvert, um, more on the introvert side rather than the extroverted side. Um, and it's just about sort of, you know, by being pensive, you're sort of you're processing, you're thinking, and you're taking information in and and outputting it in a different way. And I think that's part of what makes me strategic uh, as well. Mark, well, I was going to say optimistic. Um, you know, I think about I look look in the camera, saw hmm. good, old, good old Kermit the Frog sitting behind me, right? Who to me was the the eternal optimist when things were always going crazy on the Muppet Show. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that's uh, I I you know I feel that that's something that I've always been, right? And, and I think that's something that I 
you know, we got from my parents as well too. And, and, you know, just to me, I think that optimism to try and, you know, see the, the glass half full, uh, and know that when you're on that roller coaster, you know, and you're going down, you know, the good thing is that that roller coaster is going to come back up again. Right. So that, mm-hmm. that, that downward is, is going to come back up. Um, and just knowing that you got to hold on tight and kind of get there. So, uh, and it's hard. Sometimes I find it, it is difficult in the industry that's, you know, again, it's going through so much change to always, you know, keep that core optimism. But I think it's something that, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, always had. And I think it's, you know, it's important to, you know, find a balance. And I think as Matt's yeah. describing him, that's why him and I work so well together, because I know at his core, he has optimism as well. But that, you know, that pragmatism of kind of analyzing helps me so that I don't, you know, that optimism doesn't verge on naivete. It actually verges on a bit of realism to actually come to that center pendulum. And I think that's yeah. why, again, if we look at how well we work together, um, it's making sure that there is some, you know, critical analysis that goes with the optimism, but at the same point has that, you know, positive spirit that, you know, it, the uh, rain clouds will go away and that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel and, uh, you know, seeing through to the future. Yeah, and just, just one final question, you know, uh, for, for both of you. You know, after 20 years in, in business together, uh, um, you know, what's, what's the best thing about being an entrepreneur? from each of your perspectives? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think it's ultimately to be able to to write your own chapter, right? And so that you you actually have that opportunity each and every day. Uh, you get a clean page and you can write uh, that chapter of, of your book of what you want to do, right? And so it, it, uh, it's daunting because some days you, you start from scratch and, uh, you know, some days you've got a ton of problems and that that to-do list is not a fun list of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same point, um, you write it and you're in charge of it and you can actually control it. And, um, that lets you have some control so that if you want to, you know, stop working at three 30, so you can go hang out with your kids, um, you can do it. No one's going to question and you can set your own priorities. And that's really important, um, you know, to be able to, to do that and, you know, find that balance. Um, but, it, you know, I think as, as we think about, um, that and making our own decisions and being in control of our own destiny. Um, it's scary for sure, but at the same point, it's so rewarding because you can look back as we're doing today and talking about the past 20 years, look forward to the next 20 years uh, and know that you're ultimately in, in control of what you're doing. Matt, what about, what about your perspective on that? Yeah, I agree with Mark. I mean, it's, uh, there's, a, there's such a, a rich, a personal fulfillment and richness um, in being able to do what you want to do for a living. Uh, it, it's almost something you can't quite articulate to someone unless they've gone through it with themselves because all of that other stuff that shouldn't make sense on paper, how much risk, how stressful it can be, all of that, it just, it's just not, it's not even in, you don't even see it. It doesn't matter because the fulfillment is so, so such a high and it is true that mark and i was talking about like the highs are really high and the lows can be a little bit low sometimes um and and so i think you just you feel very alive and you feel um uh you know who doesn't want to live their life to the fullest uh i I think it's a privilege and uh you know i think mark and i feel that we have that privilege to uh feel so satisfied every day to have an idea uh, and it uh, worked bloody well hard over many, many years to suddenly have that idea be shared with hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world. Um, that's not an ego thing. That's just, uh, but it is very, very satisfying for sure. It's a cool thing, though. There's that definitely, guys, it's been really good. I mean, some great insights there. There's some good, really good answers to, to, to uh, you know, pretty probing questions there. Um, and people listen to this, and, and I always say in the end, how can people get a hold of you? Because you may have said something that sparked something, and they 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 want they want to to, to get some more insight from you guys. But what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're on all the social media channels: Twitter, Facebook, everything else. Um, and then you can email us uh, connect at marblemedia.com, dot uh, and that will get to us. And uh, we'd we'd love to hear from people. So feel free to reach out. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for coming on Canvas Podcast. It's been a delight to, to meet you guys. Great to meet you too. Thank you for the great questions too, Philip. Really enjoyed the conversation.